Good morning, church. There is something about this spread of time of 40 years, and I dwelled upon this, and it occurred to me there are references scattered throughout the Hebrew Scriptures and New Testament Scriptures about this 40-year thing. Remember, 40 years Moses lived in Midian. 40 years the Hebrew children wandered in the wilderness. King Saul, 40 years old of age when becoming the king of Israel. David, the ruler, Solomon, the ruler, 40 years they ruled. 40 is significant. It's a number that recognizes a lifespan, a generation. Often in the scripture, the 40-year period is a time of testing and trial and ultimately, through endurance, achieving a sense of clarity and purpose and harmony within God's will. Forty years of service as a minister of word and sacrament, a pastor to God's people, a proclaimer of the gospel, is no small achievement, for it is no small covenant to keep. It requires steadfast love and a merciful heart. And today, we celebrate 40 years of ministry of the Reverend Dr. Gregory Knox Jones. And so here we are, you and me and Greg, here we are in the heart of Wilmington, Delaware, a congregation, remarkable congregation, a congregation of many joys, a congregation of wide open arms, a congregation intentionally inclusive in membership and service. You are a happy staff church. I know this. <laughs> because Susan comes home and often she's exhausted, but she is always expressive of her gratitude to be here and to be with you and to serve with Greg. I also know it because you've expressed that openness to me. I can walk in here, and unlike any other church, I meet dozens of people I know. And you can welcome me as the Presbytery Executive, or often you can just know me as Mr. Susan Mosley. <laughs> and I really like that. So together, you have built this community, and you keep raising the bar. Your worship, thoughtful, inspirational, your education, provocative and thoughtful your care, your service, your fellowship, and the stewardship of this amazing church facility. You open the doors for anyone here, not for profits, music, art, hospitality. You grow gardens on your lawn. You have provocative learning and conference events, and it goes on and on. But above all that, I would remind you that Westminster, under Greg's leadership, stands out in this community is that church which reaches across religious, cultural, ethnic, immigrant, and the racial divides in our culture to build a place of community and peace and understanding. Even to be so daring is to take on the ever so delicate work of addressing peacemaking in the Middle East. Peacemaking has become your mantra. Shalom, salam, peace be with you. So in light of all that you're doing that is wonderful, there are some things you're not doing so well. You can't ever seem to close your doors to host groups and to help people. You can't seem to slow down your zeal for mission, whether it's here in Delaware or Guatemala or Congo or wherever. And you can't stop pushing that envelope, that advocacy, that yearning to do more, to stare down injustice, and to seek justice for all people. The author of the Proverbs sums it up so well. Do not envy the wicked, do not desire their company, for their hearts plot violence, and their lips talk trouble. 
Hold then for these words to be true and know that they are true for you. From Proverbs, by wisdom a house is built and through understanding it is established. Through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. You, Westminster, are indeed a house rich with love and purpose and promise. Well done, Westminster. Congratulations, Dr. Jones. Amen? My colleague, the Reverend Dr. Gregory Jones, invited me to read two passages from the prophets as a part of the celebration of his 40 years of ministry. That means 40 years of helping and healing and caring, 40 years of marching as a soldier for social justice for all of God's children. I have been asked to read two consequential passages from the prophets because our colleague, the Reverend Dr. Gregory Knox Jones, is a consequential religious leader. First in Hebrew, Bama Akdem Adonai Ikaf Lelohe Marom Haakadmenu Boolot Baagalim Bene Shana Hayeratse Adonai Baale Balfe Elim Bivrochot Nachale Shaman Hayaten Bahori Pishi Privitni Hatat Nafshi Hagidlacha Adam Ma Tov Uma Adonai Doresh Mimcha Ki im asot mishpat vaavat chesed vatsnea lechet im elohecha And in English Wherewith shall I come before God and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before God with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will God be pleased with thousands of rams and tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for what is good and what God does require? Uh, shall I give my firstborn? I'm sorry, I lost my place. For transgression, the fruit of my body, the sin of my soul? It hath been told you, O man, what is good and what God does require of you, only to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. In the second passage from Isaiah, Hadavar Asher Chaza Yeshiyahu Ben Amotz Al Yehudavi Rushalayim Hayab Acharit Hayamim Nachon Yihia Har Beit Adonai Barosh Harim Venisa Migvaot Venaharu Alav Kol Goyim Vahachu Amim Rabim Vaamru Lechu Venelcha El Har Adonai El Beit Elohe Yaakov Vayiru midarchav v'nelcha borchorutav ki mitzion teitzei Torah u'devar Adonai mirushalayim v'shafat bein hagoyim v'ochiach la'amim rabim v'chitetu charvotam li'itim v'chani totehem l'mazme rot lo yisa goy el goy cherev v'lo yomadun od milchama the words that Isaiah the son of Amot saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of God's house shall be established as the top of the mountains and shall be, and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it and many people shall go and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of God to the house of the God of Jacob. And God will teach us the ways, and we will walk in the paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of God from Jerusalem. And God shall judge between the nations, and shall decide for many peoples. 
and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Good morning. So I have a riddle, which I'm going to present to you, and then you have a little bit of time to think about it. What do Trinidad, Miami, Irma, Christian, Muslim, and Jewish children, and Vienna, oh, and the Lutheran Church all have in common? So I'll answer that in a second. But uh, first of all, my name is Harvey Price. Um, and I am beyond honored to be asked to speak at this auspicious occasion of Greg's 40th year in the ministry. Um, some of you know me as the guy that plays timpani every Easter over here. Um, some of you know me as Linda Henderson's husband. And some of you know me as um, the uh, crazy Meshugana guy, which is uh, Yiddish for crazy, that runs this project called Peace Drums. And, um, I think Greg's going to talk a little bit about it, but I will also. Um, but I just want to say that I am delighted to be here to what I consider my Christian home, Westminster Presbyterian. And I see many people and many friends who have helped birth peace drums and have given time, money, their hearts, and their homes to the peace drums cause. Um, peace drums is a music shared existence project that takes place uh, in uh, Israel that brings Christian and Muslim and Jewish children together. So there's the first part of the answer to your riddle. Um, and um, it was birthed here at Westminster and at Congregation Beth Shalom, just a few steps from here, miles from here. And um, Greg was really instrumental in making this thing happen. And I would say probably instrumental in changing the course of my life and bringing me into this project and now it's kind of taken over my life, which I'm more than happy to have happen. And um, like I said, I couldn't be happier to, to and more honored to celebrate um, this occasion with Greg. Um, it's quite an, quite an honor. Both uh, Greg, and, Greg and Camilla have been incredible in their support for Peace Drums and their encouragement to let this project take place that is 5,000 miles from here and runs fairly smoothly, insha'Allah. So I would like to answer the riddle that I gave to you. Um, and I'll give, present it one more time. I gave you the first answer, Christian and Muslim and Jewish children. Trinidad, Miami, Vienna, the Lutheran Church, and Irma. So in Israel, we have, um, for the past year, a former student of mine who was from Trinidad, a fantastic young musician, Brielle Scott, um, who has been teaching Christian and Mu Muslim and Jewish children in Haifa, Israel for peace drums. And uh, she's been giving of her time and her talents and winning the hearts of these kids and their parents for the past year. In April, her visa ran out in Israel. Um, so she had to go back to Trinidad and we had to reapply for a volunteer's visitor's visa from the Israeli government for one year so that she could return and teach again. So it took about five months of lots of, of paperwork and uh, back and forth um, by my good friend Micha Shachor, who some of you, who you, some of you have met, um, going almost on a daily basis to one Israeli ministry or another with another piece of paper saying, no, no, this is really a great person and here's support from a Jewish school and here's support from a Christian school and here's support from the Arabic community and here's support from the Muslim community. They finally granted her visa uh, about two weeks ago, which was great. And the easiest way for Brielle to go from Trinidad to get her passport in the U.S. to fly to Tel Aviv was to go through Miami. And of course, last week was a great time for her to fly from Trinidad to Miami until Irma decided to, to uh, interject herself into the picture. So uh, we had to kind of cancel, and then the Israel embassy in Miami closed its doors for a week, and so her visa is waiting for her, and we're hoping to get her 
to Miami um, by Tuesday, pick up her passport by Wednesday, and fly to Tel Aviv on, uh, on Friday, inshallah, which for, is Arabic for God's will. Why is it so important besides just to continue the mission of peace drums? Well, the last answer is because the peace drums band has been invited to come to Vienna October 24th to perform for the 500th anniversary of the Lutheran Church concert that's going to take place in Vienna at that day. And uh, that invitation came by way of a good friend of mine who runs a very large music school in Vienna um, that's administered by the Lutheran Church. And this is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. So he thought it would be a great idea to have uh, the Peace Drums Band from Israel come to Vienna and play on this concert in the Music Verein in the Golden Hall, which is maybe the single most prestigious concert venue in all of Europe, maybe all of the world. And of course I accepted that invitation heartily, thinking, yeah, we'll have plenty of time to prepare these kids because I have a great teacher in Trinidad, in, from Trinidad in Israel. Well, we have less time than we thought, but it's still going to happen. And the last part of this puzzle is Vienna, which is where the, the concert will take place, but also because Vien the music school in Vienna, which will be hosting the kids from Israel, want to start Peace Drums Vienna for Syrian refugee kids that are now, a lot of them, a lot of them are in, are in Vienna, and they want to have the, the Syrian refugee kids, both the, the Christian and Muslim kids, play music with the local kids from Vienna. So that's how that all ties together, unbelievably so, and so that's what's been on my mind. But, but this morning, what's on my mind is, is thanking Greg for allowing me the opportunity to stand up here and speak to you all. So thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. This is the longer version of Salam. Uh, <laughs> uh, just a few days ago, uh, myself and my wife, we went for Hajj. Hajj is the pilgrimage uh, for Muslims. And uh, during Hajj, uh, we usually visit two cities, uh, Medina and Mecca. And while I was in Medina, I was at this mosque where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was praying and the orders came to change the direction uh, from, from Jerusalem to Mecca for the prayer. And uh, so th that mosque is called uh, Mosque of Two Qiblas, Two Directions. Um, and, and obviously, you know, before that, between Jews and Muslims, there was a lot more harmony because they were both praying towards the same direction. So this changed uh, some of that. And people had objections uh, for why Muslims have changed their direction for prayer. So a verse was revealed in the Quran that um, that basically uh, boils down to boils down the, the essence of religion. And that essence of religion, whatever we do in our religious lives, boils down to one attaining one character characteristic, and that is righteousness. So our giving, our helping others, our our doing all works of charity they all help us achieve righteousness. So, so this verse explained and defined what righteousness is. And while I was in that mosque, Greg sent me an email and he said that I'm open to whatever you would like to read, but this is what I found for your consideration. And I was at that mosque. So, and, and I, as I read that, I told him that there wouldn't be any uh, more appropriate uh, choice of a verse from the Holy Quran to read at this occasion, to remind all of us 
that no matter whether we are Muslims, Jews, or Christians, we have one goal uh, for all our uh, practices in life, and that is to achieve righteousness. And the 40 years of righteousness uh, you know, can, be, can be summed in this verse. So I'll recite in Arabic first, and then I'll present the translation. لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ كِبْلَ الْمَشْرِكِ وَالْمَغْرِبَ وَلَكِنِ الْبِرَّ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَالْمَلَائِكَةِ وَالْكِتَابِ وَالنَّبِيِّينَ وَآتَاءِ الْمَالَ عَلَى حُبِّهِ ذَوِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ وَالسَّاعِلِينَ وَفِي الرِّكَابِ وَأَقَامَ الصَّلَاةِ وَآتَاءِ الزَّكَاةِ وَالْمُوفُونَ بِأَهْدِهِمْ إِذَا أَهْدَى وَالصَّابِرِينَ فِي الْبَأْسَاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ وَحِينَ الْبَأْسِ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُتَّقُونَ Righteousness is not that you turn your faces towards the east or the west. But true righteousness is in one who believes in one God. So I think just this part of the verse explains the, the similarities and the, and the greater goal between all religions. You know, it doesn't matter whether we face east or the west or whatever direction. The goal is to achieve righteousness. So righteousness is in, in one who believes in God, the last day, the angels, the books, and the prophets, and gives wealth in spite of love for it to relatives, to orphans, to the needy, to the travelers, and those who ask for help and for freeing of slaves, and those who establish prayer and give charity, and those who fulfill their promise when they promise, and those who are patient in poverty and hardship and during struggle. Those are the ones who have been true, and it is those who are the righteous. So I stand in front of you, and I bear witness that I have seen Gregory Jones do all of these things. And that is the definition of a righteous person in Islam. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah the most merciful and the most compassionate assalamu alaikum to all of you you all know the word salam and its meaning by now that was such a beautiful rendering of peace salam means peace and when we say assalamu alaikum we say peace upon all of you but in islamic tradition assalam is also the name of god so when we say assalamu alaikum not only are we praying that may peace be with you, we are also praying that may God be with you. Uh, I, I feel deeply moved and touched and honored by my inclusion in today's service. Reverend Gregory Jones is like an elder brother to me in spirituality. And I think it is absolutely fantastic that he has completed 40 years of service in the service of God and in the service of humanity and in the service of this church. I would like to thank and congratulate him for his service, but I would also like to thank this church for being so blessed that you have him, and I'm sure that you have become richer because of him, and he has also become a better servant of God because of his congregation. Without his church, he would not be a pastor. But above all, I also want to thank Camilla Jones for letting Greg be Greg. As a man who likes to serve people in God and who also loves his wife, I know that we cannot do anything without the love, blessing, support, and permission 
of our partners in life. <laughs> this 40 years, as Jim Mosley said, is very interesting from a spiritual point of view. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, became a prophet at the age of 40. And in Islamic traditions, we believe that men do not reach maturity until they reach the age of 40. So I think Greg has now reached maturity as a pastor. <laughs> and while I'm sure everybody is grateful for everything that you did in the last 40 years, the real work begins now, Greg, from tomorrow. <laughs> We're all children of Adam. Muslims have just celebrated the Eid, which also requires those who can afford and those who have opportunity, like Brother Naveed and also Mani can go and perform the Hajj in celebrating uh, the piety and sacrifice of the family of Abraham. May peace be upon him and his family. It is in his memory that I want to recite a verse from the Quran in which God says, who is better in faith? Who is better in faith than him or her who has sacrificed their entire identity in the service of God? Who is better than him or her in faith who has sacrificed their entire identity in the service of God and therefore God took Abraham as his intimate friend. So it is a fabulous statement of God's relationship with Adam, with, uh, not with Adam, sorry, with Abraham as an intimate friend. And I think after 40 years of selfless service, Greg, I think, also deserves that title as a friend of God. And uh, from today onwards, I'm also going to get into the habit of name dropping. And I'm going to say, Greg is a friend of God and he's my friend, so you know. <laughs> I'm connected too. <laughs> Greg is not just your pastor. He's the pastor of Delaware and beyond. He has stood up for social justice in this case more often than not. He's been there when there was, when racism showed its head. He was there when anti-Semitism showed its head. He was there when Islamophobic events have happened. He has attended and stood up with Muslims in solidarity on more occasions than I can remember. And even as far away as the Holy Land, his struggle and his voice for social justice, for equality and freedom is resonating. So in many ways, Greg is also the pastor of Delaware. Now if only if he was also the pastor of America, then America would indeed be great again. <laughs> Greg has been a mentor to me in many ways. This church, I have spoken here so many times, numerous times, has become an important station in my journey of spirituality. I have given here many lectures on mysticism, on Islam, on the mysticism of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And those lectures in an open, uh, highly uh, tolerant environment where people who are of God, people whose hearts are open to the mysteries of God and to spirituality listen to me, allowed me to grow in ways where other forums would not allow me to grow in my spirituality. And all of this was facilitated by Reverend Gregory Jones, and therefore I think of him as an important mentor for me, spiritually speaking. He has spoken in my classes on justice, he has spoken at our masajid, and so we are all very grateful for him. I want to share a particular moment. I was in, in Dover when I heard about the shooting in Orlando, and uh, I was horrified, but I also realized that this was going to be a major event uh, and may contribute to the growth of Islamophobia exponentially. So it was critical and important that Muslim community come out immediately and condemn what happened in Orlando. I was in Dover. I was, I'd gone there to drop my son for uh, something called Boy State or some event like that. Uh, and it was already 4 o'clock and uh, 
the headline news was all about Orlando. So I was trying to reach various members of the Muslim congregations and I was having trouble finding a mosque to have a press conference so that we could condemn what happened in Orlando and express the solidarity of Muslims uh, with the victims and send our prayers to them and our support to them. And so I call Gregory Jones and this church then became the platform, the forum from which Naveed and I came here and condemned the shootings in Orlando and we also reached out to the victims and sent our prayers and blessings and expressed our solidarity for the victims of the Orlando shooting uh, from this church. So in many ways this church is a second home not just to me but to our community too. Many, many years before Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, became a prophet, he was living as an ordinary person in the city of Mecca. There were many criminals in the city and so people who used to come to Mecca were often robbed. And there was one particular case where a, a, a businessman came to Mecca and he was cheated out of his goods and he had no recourse to help so he just reached out to the community of Mecca. And the leaders of Mecca got together and created something called Hilfil Fudul or it was the League of the Virtuous. And the objective of that League of Virtuous was to ensure that justice prevailed in Mecca. So these people of goodwill, these people who cared about justice, got together in order to ensure that social justice, equality, safety and peace prevailed in the city of Mecca. And under the leadership of Greg, imams, pastors, reverends, rabbis have come together many times to act as the League of Virtuous in Delaware to do good things. Even though it's informal, I think Greg, since we already have our capes and uniforms, it could be like the League of Justice, you know. <laughs> so we should have the League of the Virtuous to stand up for social justice and for peace in the state of Delaware. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he continues to serve you and the, and the community of Delaware for many, many years to come. And I hope that the impact of his service, the impact of his love continues to resonate in our state. Amen. Forty years of ordination. I'm so grateful they let me out of the home this morning to be with you. <laughs> it sounds old, doesn't it? Actually, I went straight from high school to college to seminary to my first church. I was ordained at 25 years old, and there should be a rule against that. <laughs> I was young. I was inexperienced. I was naive when I was foisted upon the unsuspecting people of First Presbyterian Church, Lexington, Kentucky. Many times I have reflected on their kindness and their generosity to embrace me as their associate pastor and how patient they were and how patient God was. Remarkable blessings have come my way. But that's not to say that I've been untouched by suffering or not had some really rough stretches to go through in life. No one breezes through life without dark and challenging times. But a whisper in my soul that the darkness would one day lift. The conviction that God is always working to bring life out of death nudges to keep plodding forward until the dawn would finally appear. The precious, precious gift of a supportive soulmate. And wonderful people in each of the congregations I have served have spawned in me a very grateful heart. Life is thrilling and maddening, exciting and teeth-grinding. 
rapturous and precarious. Decisive turning points abound. Decisions we make, decisions others make, accidents of history, forces both cruel and benevolent, and the hand of God send our lives spinning in one particular direction rather than 100 other might have beens. One example, there's little possibility that I would be standing in this pulpit today, that I would have the good fortune to be the pastor of this magnificent church if it were not for a policy decision by two graduate schools. When I was a young pup in seminary, I focused all of my attention on pastoral counseling. I thought I wanted to spend my career counseling one-on-one -on -one with people. So in my final year of seminary, I began to apply to the two schools that offered these doctoral programs that I wanted to attend, and to my dismay, neither of those schools would admit anyone until they had spent two years in parish ministry. What a ridiculous policy. <laughs> So begrudgingly, I put my degree on hold and decided to sign up and go into the parish ministry for a couple of years. And about six months after being in the church, it dawned on me that this is where I was supposed to be. I really think this is where God wanted me to be. What a brilliant policy those schools had. <laughs> Without it, I would never have had the privilege of serving this great congregation and working with the marvelous staff here. At a time in our nation's history when the clout of the church has diminished, I am awed by the way the Spirit of God has blown through the lives of our members, making a significant impact on one another making a significant impact on our community and even our world. In our worship, we always strive to connect the scriptures with our daily lives. We present music that stirs our souls in ways that words simply cannot. We pray for the world. We develop hearts of gratitude. We hear words that comfort and we hear words that challenge. And we engage in rituals that nurture and heal and draw us closer to God and draw us closer to one another. Our Christian education introduces our children to Christianity and helps instill in them the important knowledge that God loves them and will always love them. Our youth find help in figuring out what's important in life and what's not and the benefits of a spiritual life. Our adults have opportunities to deepen their faith and discuss how best to navigate life in the 21st century. Our caring ministries provide a healing touch whenever we suffer a loss, whenever we have diminished health, whenever we have problems too great to shoulder alone. If you were here yesterday, you would have sat with 400 citizens of Wilmington, the governor, the mayor, the chief of police, the president of our city council, and the director of the Center for Justice were all here to share plans for how we might be able to reduce violence in our city and to hear about the incredible work that's being done by Father Gregory Boyle, working with the toughest gangs in Los Angeles. You would have been proud of your church if you weren't here for hosting this event, to find ways to reduce the violence and to find ways to steer young people in this community in the right direction. The multiple ways you share God's love with a hurting world is truly inspiring. We feed the poor. We build habitat houses. We provide shelter for temporarily homeless families. We drive people to doctor's appointments and support men who are transitioning from prison. 
Our nation struggles with drug and alcohol abuse. It's an epidemic right now. We provide space in our building nearly every day of the week for an addiction group. Forty people come. Today's Sunday, there are two groups today, later today. We provide classrooms on school days in the afternoons for 45 at-risk youth to help them understand their homework, to stay up to grade. And a big part of that program also is learning important spiritual values and how to get through a conflict without using your hands and feet, but to talk it out. We provided 500 brand new backpacks stuffed with new school supplies to help children in our community make a good start on the school year. We sent 15 mission teams to help rebuild New Orleans. Providing, we're providing hundreds of water filters in Guatemala right now. These are only a partial list of the many things you do to make this the best possible place I could ever dream of serving. Speaking of which, I don't think we've announced the tally on the capital campaign. We started with a goal to reach $2 million. We set a stretch goal of $2.3 million. We finally have wrapped up the goal. The campaign raised $2.7 million. You are applauding yourself because you did it. Our church family is brimming with great minds, generous hearts, and faithful people striving to live their lives in harmony with God. Many of you remember when our associate pastor, Chad Miller, drowned in the Brandywine River along with his brother. It was shocking, and it was painful. Just five days later, when his parents and all of his relatives flew here for the service we were holding, we wrapped our arms around that family, and we kept them from collapsing. I really don't believe they would have survived that tragedy without the love we extended to them and without the tears we shed with them. The Apostle Paul said, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And that was so healing for the Miller family. It was hard, it was painful, but it was Westminster at its best. One of the greatest benefits of ministry is being with people at pivotal points in their lives. Baptisms, illnesses, marriages, tragedies, deaths, celebrations. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of your journey. You have made my life so rich. Taking a step back and reflecting on some of the insights I've gleaned over my 40 years of ministry, one gem of wisdom is this. In order to possess a vibrant faith, it must always be evolving. There's always more truth to be discovered. There are always greater depths within ourselves to descend. There are always misunderstandings to correct. And there is always action to be taken. Dictionaries list the word faith as a noun 
Well, it's a noun sometimes, but it's also a verb. Faith is not primarily about believing certain doctrines. It's about living in a particular manner. Forty years ago, when I began my ministry, there was little being done in interfaith relations. For Presbyterians, stepping across spiritual boundaries meant getting together with Southern Baptists. <laughs> Maybe Roman Catholics. One exception of that was following the Holocaust. That had prompted a few tentative discussions, Jewish-Christian dialogues. Christians had mercifully put away the sword for converting people, but most people, practically everyone, believed only Christians are going to heaven. Today that's changing. An increasing number of people respect the faith of others and are pleasantly surprised to find how much our three faiths have in common. One of the joys of being in ministry at Westminster, and there have been countless joys, has been the interfaith connections we've forged. Our Muslim Christian dialogue group, lectures, panel discussions, and Ramadan dinners have helped us to counter those destructive stereotypes of Islam that permeate the media and has helped provide opportunities for us to build new lasting friendships. And our work with Congregation Beth Shalom to create and sustain peace drums and to resettle our Afghan um, refugee family have deepened our interfaith relationships Tomorrow, as you know, is September 11th. Prior to 2001, that was an unremarkable date on the calendar. But after the terrorists hijacked those four planes and flew them into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and crashed in the field in Pennsylvania, that date has been etched on every American's mind ever since. Some of you know people who perished that day. Lives that ended far too soon. It was a tragic and gruesome reminder that there are extremists in our world that must be stopped and an ideology that must be countered. Despite the fact that Jews, Christians, Muslims, and people of claiming no faith at all have fought side by side in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria to defeat the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS. Many have used the actions of extremists to fan the flames of Islamophobia. Today, it's more important than ever for people of goodwill of the Abrahamic faiths to build friendships, to work together, and to promote the core values that we share. The Ku Klux Klan and white supremacists that use the name of Jesus to justify racism and anti-Semitism don't come close to representing Christianity. Militant Jewish settlers who rob Palestinians of their land do not represent Judaism. And members of ISIS who commit acts of terrorism do not represent Islam. People of the Abrahamic faiths are given a mission. We are to bring good news to the poor. We are to open the eyes of the blind. We are to bring freedom to the oppressed. God beckons us to shine like a lamp in a room of shadows, chasing the propaganda and the fears away. God commands us to feed the hungry, to comfort the ill, and to welcome the stranger. We understand this not as a burdensome duty that weighs heavily on us, but rather as an opportunity that inspires us to become beacons of light in today's callous climate. 
When we extend compassion to people in dire need, we touch people with the most important force in all the world, love, which has the great impact of infusing our own lives with meaning, purpose, and joy. God expects us to stand resolute when faced with enemies of God's righteous realm. And God emboldens us to become lasers of love that expose lies to the light of day, shine truth in places of injustice, and reveal God's will in a troubled world where too many political leaders have chosen a reckless route of rattling sabers rather than the path that pursues peace. It is the duty of all members of the Abrahamic faiths to lead the way. It is a noble calling and we dare not leave it to others. The stakes are too high. The future of our children, the future of our grandchildren, the future of this planet is at stake. But I live in hope. Because God never tires of bringing good out of evil and can work through faithful people like you. Blessed. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the children of God. Amen.